about the gorilla. And uh, we're going to um, we're going to all present in a horizontal manner. Um, but I'm uh, I'm introducing because I listed that. So um, uh, let's all welcome first of all Adam Arnson, who's uh, assistant professor at UT um, El Paso, and he's going to start with a presentation. Then we'll each of us are going to basically introduce ourselves to better introductions and just the names of um, uh, affiliation. And then uh, we're going to save plenty of time for open conversation with the audience. So without further ado, Adam. Okay. Can we can I have the hashtags up there to encourage a digital conversation as well for those both in the room and elsewhere. Um, so in line with what Phil said, my, my slides provide what I think of as an overview of the ways that I've been engaging uh, digital research and digital publishing. Um, I would say that when I started graduate school, I had basically zero engagement with, with uh, digital things. Um, but I've now, in these, these four years of teaching and, and towards the end of graduate school, found the ways in which this emerging world was very important to what I see the history profession moving towards. Um, and I now, when I, my own graduate students, I can't really think of them being able not to have some engagement with digital history and digital humanities as they go forward. Um, I, I want to talk briefly about three topics, digital research, digital analysis, and digital publishing. Um, and I think that, again, though there's that kind of uh, future shock element of where we are, right? That, you know, the card catalog, walking and actually getting the books off the shelves and seeing what's next to each other, beginning to become like, you know, having had a, a, a cassette player, you know, or a VHS recorder. These things are, are quickly changing. Um, but I think the ways in which people are so obviously using digital research um, and to, to a, I think, a, a decent extent, digital publishing in various ways uh, points to how digital analysis is really the, the area that I think is most changing and most new still, but this still is really only a, a few years old. So just to remind us, lots of organizations are putting a lot of money into digitizing sources, whether those are libraries, the Library of Congress, individual university libraries, historical societies. Um, we're seeing the next generation of that in right, interactive library catalogs. The, the New York a Public Library has gone to sort of having reviews and ratings in a social media sense within the catalog itself. And there's talk at the National Archives and other places of as they renovate and change the way their catalogs work to be able to talk about and annotate individual items as you move through them. So I think that there's a kind of interplay between the way in which you can go online and get a picture of whatever scanned thing from 1854 that you were thinking of is an obvious thing we can do now uh, to how uh, there'll be a new kind of social media interactive piece of that, I think, in the, in the next few years. Similarly, we, we have the internet to, to connect us to all these various resources, but also when events are changing, Websites themselves can become those sources of recent history source um, material, and the Internet Archive is a place where there's that tension between the Internet as it was and the Internet as it is that I think people, again, use on a very common basis. When there's lots of, when, when things get deleted or changed, uh, there's always a record these days that people go back to. Um, I'll come to digital publishing, my piece of it at the end, and then I'll let the, the, those associated with publishers talk more, but I think that when people say digital humanities or digital history, they almost always mean digital analysis, right? They're not showing them that they're so proud that they use JSTOR to get this article. Um, and I think there, there are levels at which that also is in effect. And I think, I, I, again, I'm just here to point them out and then to talk a little bit about my engagement towards the end. One is just knowing when people are talking about what you're interested in talking about, right? Having Google Alerts linked to the topics that you're researching or writing about to find that community. I, I find that an easy way to do so. Um, Google, of course, uh, has created massive databases of information. Um, and one of the prominent ways that people are working through that are through engrams. Um, I actually had an interesting one about cleometrics and uh, digital history as terms. But I also pick, I picked this one to go back further in time to look at when is slaveholder rather than slave owner or slave master, uh, the terminology that's appearing in printed sources. Um, then there's the kind of biggest, biggest data uh, elements. There's the digging into data challenge, um, which that's part of one of the funded projects is about railroads in the south on the right. 
Um, and then there's the ways in which that massive amount of data that's out there can be used um, for our own analysis. This is an analysis of how years are mentioned in Wikipedia, whether favorable or unfavorable. You can see that until the year 1400, years that are mentioned are mentioned favorably, and then after 1500, things get bad, until the very recent past. If it happened very recently, people are very happy about it. And, and those deep spikes are the Civil War and World War II, if I recall. Um, from This is from researchtrends.com, issue 30. I, I, the name, I don't think I had uh, put on the slide. Um, the next level, and, and, and Phil has an engagement with this as well, is uh, with various apps, I would say, websites, um, technologies that are mashing up the various sets of data we have between very contemporary data like the, the basic GIS shape files and more historical data like historical maps, georeferencing and putting them in place. Uh, I've been working with a team at UTEP to do so for El Paso maps. We have about a thousand El Paso maps scanned and we're slowly working through them, putting them on hyper cities to create a much deeper sense of El Paso history by being able to, to layer those maps in the way that this is demonstrating here. Um, there are net, a number of projects working with network diagrams, some of them over geography. This is, again, a very prominent one. But thinking about, uh, in my own work, I'm working with African Americans who are moving back and forth between the US and Canada. And I'm looking at their, their points of connection. Who are they in units with in the Civil War? Who are family members? Well, where, when they move to communities, who are the people starting, uh, signing affidavits and depositions for them? Are those because of their jobs? Is that because of their church affiliation? These are the kinds of networking uh, diagrams I'm creating as well. And I, I feel like we're at a moment where the tools are not standardized at all. But, I mean, there's a lot of interesting analysis going on. I, I, I think there's a decent amount of duplication between these various programs. And I, I don't know if it's how we're going to figure out which one is the one everyone's going to use. But Gephi is another system that uses both network uh, connections and geographic information. <coughs> Neatline is yet another recently developed system um, that's, that it has a nice set of presentation tools that often sit over artifacts or using modern maps and artifacts together. And there may be people in the room with connections to, to some of these uh, groups as well. And I think we're beginning to get a sense of the network. There definitely, uh, there's definitely a genealogy of digital humanities with very strong ties to, to George Mason in Virginia especially. Um, a lot of the centers, I feel like you can tie back to individuals who were at those two universities in those um, digital labs. But I, the good news is it's spreading further afield. And I think people like me who, who didn't go to school there, who's, whose connection is only because I see that this technology can do the work I'm now interested in doing, um, there is space for people at that camps and other places to gain this information. So, and to point in the publishing direction, uh, I think there are ways in which the internet interacts with traditional publishing, um, as well as ways in which the internet is becoming a publishing platform that the academy is still unsure about in many ways. Uh, obvious things like having a faculty page that linked to my, you know, uh, brick and mortar meat space uh, publications and and connections, um, but also creating a Google profile and using the, uh, that to help move my search engine finding ability, the optimization to find me and my projects, the parts of things I want to emphasize rather than those just have really strong web ties. Um, using my website as a space to expand my book, to have my full bibliography, to put up maps, to talk about my talks, to, to list the few errors I've found so far and the things that need to be changed. Um, and then promotion, right, that I've, I've been writing for the New York Times, the Union series and other places in a way that's out of the material of my book and my research, but is both is both part of it and different from it. Um, and I think I think of that as almost in the promotion mode as, as much as it's in the research mode. Um, but there are of course ways in which internet sites are being used to promote new research. Um, Phil is the editor of this urban history uh, journal companion piece, and and, I, and you're the you're the North American editor, is that correct? The multimedia editor. The multimedia editor. Um, so he'll speak more about that, but there are um, ways in which the, the Urban History Journal and its digital components interact, not completely, I would say, as, as someone about to be in one of these, but, um, but to a great extent, not everything is, is reproduced in both. Um, he'll speak also more about Scalar, the, the platform I'll be using for that urban history interaction, um, and the things that it can do. Part of what it can do 
is what's referred to as semantic web uh, uh, navigation, right? That rather than the way in a book we're following a certain path, unless it's a choose your own adventure kind of academic treatise, uh, this allows a different path through the material and allows a different kind of anal analysis and organization. Uh, and I think that there are benefits to that in how we think about things like um, my main place on the internet so far that I've been using to put forward it for my one of my future projects is I have a very serial, not very well organized blog, but where every week I'm promoting an image from this home savings and loan set of buildings that are mostly in California and are, and are under threat because they, they've changed hands from home savings to Washington Mutual to J.P. Morgan Chase, and some of them, been, like this one, for example, has been painted over uh, the West Portal Branch here in San Francisco. So I've been trying to put forward that material, but Scalar, when I get a chance to rework it all through Scalar, I'll, I'll be able, able to organize it both chronologically by when I posted them, as well as geographically around the, the locations I'm talking about, as well as chronologically by when the various artworks were done, as well as by themes, um, which ones are about mosaics, which ones are about paintings, which ones are about <coughs> sculptures. So I look forward to using that flexibility. I just have to find the time to, to get there. Um, similarly, but is Facebook publishing, right? Uh, is, is, is Twitter publishing? I, I think at some level it is. It's a place where we have a professional profile and it can be used in that way. And I think, um, I, again, I don't think, the way Wikipedia is not interested in, in having original research. They want people to be citing other places where that original research exists. Um, for my, for the most part, I use Facebook and Twitter as places to um, promote, clarify, explain conversations that I'm already having in more accepted scholarly venues. But I do think of it as part of how my digital uh, engagement and my scholarly profile interact. Um, and again, I, I had the, the hashtags and the Twitter material up there uh, earlier as well. Um, finally, I think people have have reservations about, especially about social media uh, and how it should relate to their their profile. On the other hand, they want people to find them and their materials, um, and I, I, that tension, right? Like, how does one promote one's material by announcing it to the right audience rather than seeming an over promoter or you know being thrown in with pictures of cats? Um, that how is how is that balance found? I think I think we're coming to a point where the engagement with with the internet as part of your scholarly uh, persona is required, um, and I think it's just a matter of how how does the social media piece fit in, right? I think the idea that someone wouldn't have a website uh, for themselves or wouldn't expect their publisher to have a website for their book uh, that would be the first level. I think that's an, people would be upset or surprised about that. On the other hand, does that website do what they want, right? I mean, I have a website that has much more of an engagement with the audience of the book, announcing talks, you know, having tours uh, in terms of places I would go based on the book, having extra pictures, stuff like that. I don't think my publisher would, would want to put that material on their website. So I think we have to think about how, what, how much of it is on us and how much of it is on our partners, publishers, and others. Um, I encourage people to research themselves online also to see what's out there, right? If you assume that you know what will happen when you Google yourself or maybe more importantly Google the topic on which you plan to be an expert and you find that you're nowhere to be seen, I think it's important to, to create digital footprints that make that happen. Again, just briefly, Google alert yourself. Find out what people are talking about you and what they're saying. Um, use selected works as a way to track your audience. Um, Selected works and is is linked to an open access site where you can either put the materials or if you can't do that then you can put links to the materials and it gives me a sense of how many times my articles are being read. Um, I, there are certain articles they have been cited in places, but they're clearly being read in classrooms, and so maybe their citations five years down the road or ten years down the road from those interactions um, that I'm seeing because people are downloading it from where I have posted it. You can learn where your book is selling. And, uh, and, and to who? Both numbers and geography. My first book's about Civil War St. Louis. It's a place where the north, south, and west come together. It sells really well in St. Louis. Um, but it does sell other places too. So, and um, I can track which posts are interest, people are interested on in my website, um, what, what brings them on certain days, 
there was, in terms of the home savings work, there's been a whole discussion about this um, statue of a horse outside an IHOP near the L near LAX airport. It happens to be a Miller Sheets studio design. I had written about it. It got posted to in, the, in this audience that had been really interested in what is this horse doing outside the IHOP. I was able to find an answer on my website. Um, I mean, I think there's an opportunity to get too far into the competitive nature of, of, of where do I stand versus everyone in the world, right? That uh, in clout is, is, a, is a site that ranks your kind of influence. I'm right about the middle of 51. I think like Justin Bieber is about 100, so just to give you perspective. But, um, but it gives me a sense of, of who's looking at one of these dark colors. I think the darkest color is Facebook. The, the lighter color is, is Twitter and the one between is LinkedIn. Um, where, what audience, where are people finding me, where are my audiences, and how does that relate to what they're actually reading? Um, I don't think Cloud does a great job of dividing out your personal content and your academic content. I mean, there are ways to do that, but uh, it, you know, how, how one's engagement uh, in scholarship should be measured on these various platforms, I think, is an open question that, that we have to think about if it's going to matter in a way that can be measurable with other than a kind of informal, oh yes, I know more about this person because I've seen their tweets or I've seen their website or I've seen this funny video they posted or whatever it happened to be. Um, that's something I think still to be determined. And now I hand it over to my panelists to take it from there. Great. Well, thank you very much, Adam. That was a great introduction, I think, to um, to a wide range of uh, digital research and publishing, just as the title of our panel suggests. But it was it's a um, it's a great ex it's, it's a great um, sort of landscape view that I, I'll take off from. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna I have a dual role really as a scholar and also somebody who's been in, in, uh, involved in the development of uh, platforms for um, for uh, scholarly publication. Um, and uh, also I've worked a lot with. Uh, with university presses on these problems. And then we're going to go next to um, Susan Ferber from Oxford University Press, who came all the way from the New York office, and Niels Hooper from uh, University of California Press, who came all the way from the Berkeley office. So um, I think Adam, I'll think about it. Adam's a great example of a young scholar who's really a citizen of uh, cyberspace. He's, a, um, he's clearly working at all different levels uh, from um, exploiting the, uh, the repositories and archives that are available online, new kinds of tools for using them, um, social media for uh, networking and promoting his own work, um, and then these platforms for, uh, for developing publications. Um, one question I've always asked, I've been involved in uh, computational means for scholarships since I was a graduate student um, just a little few miles from here at Stanford. Uh, back in the 80s, and um, I always uh, felt that the, there was a justification for putting all this time into learning a technology um, and the expense of, of these machines and everything, which was that um, you shouldn't try to, you shouldn't bother with these machines uh, and all this technology if you can do um, the same kind of intellectual work without it. So um, I started using um, computers for statistical analysis of census data in, in San Francisco, actually, um, in the 19th century. And I knew that these are these are computations that I couldn't do myself. So uh, so the machine did a, a job for me that I couldn't do at home. I couldn't do my analog means or with my pen and pencil. And uh, you know the the kinds of um, tasks that computers have taken on in the humanities, in particular, uh, have grown so widely that uh, and, and they conform to this rule: these uh, massive searches, say in. Uh, um, digitized newspapers of the 19th century. I, I dreamt about that actually in the 80s. In fact, I even uh, uh, experimented with using a Kurzweil scanner, this gigantic thing uh, that actually had a, an optical eye that moved across the, the newspapers and tried to read them, and they were just so messy. And I thought, wow, one day if we just scan all these newspapers, we can revolutionize research. And now, you know, these big corporations have done it. So, so now we're in a world where we've got um, these amazing. Uh, um, uh, it's like an archipelago of, of, of um, technological affordances that allow our scholarship to do new and amazing things, to ask new kinds of questions, um, and to uh, to ans answer them in new ways. Uh, and even to present um, interactive you know, scholarship in interactive ways that was that you wouldn't be able to do in the old technology of the book. And the book is, after all, remember, printed book is a technology. It's not the uh, reference form for 
all of knowledge before us. It, it was invented in a particular moment, and it served a particular lifespan, and there were scrolls and clay tablets before that, and you know, Aristotle got along just fine without books the way that we bind them now. Um, so, uh, so we're in a new phase, and it's a, it's a, it's a, um, uh, it's a publishing revolution that, uh, that's in every way um, comparable to the, the print revolution. But what do we do with it? We're right in the middle of it, and um, and it seems to me that well, this is the kind of the point I'm going to make in a few minutes. I'm going to try to take here. So I think we're still stalled. Actually, I've worked for a lot of years to try to help mainstream digital scholarship. I was struck early on, as I've just kind of given a background to, but uh, was certainly by the 90s when the first web browsers came in, around you know Mosaic and Netscape. Um, and I was just starting my first uh, tenure track job at, at the USC in those years, and I was just really caught up in the potentiality of this stuff. And I got right into um, uh, the digital archiving uh, process. Um, actually, we were trying to develop a platform that wound up looking, and that was that was uh, wound up being basically hypercities, but it was the precursor to hypercities, a, a space, spatial, textual, um, temporal search and retrieval uh, engine. And uh, you know, we didn't have a digital archive to, to search. And we had um, something like uh, two million photographs of Los Angeles at USC. So I launched the project to create our digital archive at USC. And I wound up being an associate dean of libraries for five years and, and, uh, and you know, hired a bunch of people and arranged the whole thing. So, um, so and as I was doing that, simultaneously, hundreds of libraries and archives around the world have been doing the same thing and developing metadata standards, and now we can search the web in the most amazing way and find all these archives at our fingertips. Um, but uh, I was also um, excited about the possibilities of, of analyzing and presenting research in new ways. And, um, and so I, I embarked on a series of my own publications, but also um, efforts to support other scholars to create, to cultivate uh, digital scholarship, that is scholarship they can publish online, uh, in new interactive ways, ways that uh, would be impossible in a book. Say, so for instance, using um, uh, media forms that you just can't put in a book, uh, either you know, large maps or you know, panoramas or video. And um, the, pr the, the premise of it was great because we would come up with these very cool interactive sites, but the problem was they were always very expensive. I calculated over the years that um, it, it, it's about $30,000 to make a good um, uh, custom uh, web designed and programmed work of scholarship. Because you know, you've got to factor in the leave time for the scholar and the programmers and the designers that, that are somehow coming to your uh, service through some kind of grant or whatever. Um, and that's not a sustainable publishing model. It's, it's produced a lot of cool things. And some of them uh, have wound up as um, companions to the journal that I am the multimedia editor for. Now, I used to be the North American editor, so we write about that. Um, and uh, that's the Cambridge University Press's journal called Urban History. Um, and so we would uh, put a lot of resources, say a graduate student. We got, in one, for one project, that was the Urban Icons Project, we had a grant to do this symposium, and we uh, had a graduate student for a couple of years, and she um, to help develop the site. So you know, if you factor in all those, products, those costs, we had an edited you know, special issue with six articles, and we cross-tabulated them all, and we had this library of images, and, um, and you can all visit it, it's all free, because, uh, because Cambridge and other publishers have still not figured out how to charge for this stuff. So it just hangs outside of the subscription envelope, as we say in the, in the parlance of that kind of uh, publishing. Um, and so anybody can, can hit it. Well, um, Cambridge loves my journal uh, because our subscription uh, figures keep going up and up every year, and the most downloaded essays in, or articles in the Cambridge, among Cambridge history journals are ours. Uh, and, it's, and they tend to be the ones that are, um, a great many of them are the ones that were featured in our, in our multimedia companions to those special issues. So the process there was, was always that we would have, some people would, would uh, submit an article, it would be peer reviewed by the regular process, if it was accepted, then we would invite them to do a, a companion, or we could do this for a whole special issue. And then we moved into uh, the next phase, which we had planned from years earlier, we thought we would do it in stepwise fashion, introduce online only articles, that would be invite articles that were created as digital works, and then submitted to us, and then we would peer review them, and then, uh, then, then ultimately publish them under the aegis of the Cambridge University Press. Um, 
And I was very excited about this next venture. I thought that's why I became multimedia editor exclusively. I was kind of doing both jobs for a while. And I thought this was really going to be the place where our, all those efforts were going to take off. And, um, and the, it hasn't quite taken off. And, and the measure I use is that we don't, get we don't get submissions over the transom. People aren't simply creating online scholarship, online only, or digital scholarship, uh, and then submitting it to us. Uh, we say, oh, great, thanks for the submission. We'll get it out to the referees. Um, instead, I recruit them. Everything we've got in the pipeline, I basically recruit. And you know, I think they're exciting projects. We've got some really interesting ones. Um, I, could, I could run through a list of them quickly, but I don't want to take too much time. I can use them as examples in our, in our conversation. But, um, well, let me just tell you about one. So in Hypercities, uh, Gregor Callas and Diane Favreau and, uh, and, um, uh, and a couple of co-authors uh, created a, a 3D digital model of um, Augustine Rome. It's the most authoritative uh, 3D model based on the best scholarship of what exists in these buildings and so on. And then Callas uh, wrote an article about a, 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 an imperial procession of 404 CE uh, by the Emperor Honorius and analyzed the path of the procession through the forum and then visualizes, using these 3D visualizations, visualizes what the statues would have looked like from each point of the, um, of the procession and then analyzes both the statuary and the political dynamics and the symbolism of what's, what was, what's going on. So this is the kind of thing you, you really can't do in print. Um, and so, you know, we've been, uh, you know, that's been going through the peer review process and so on. Well, the other area that I had a hand in was, um, I'm sure in my, in my third year as uh, uh, one of the board of editors of the American Historical Review, and um, Rob Schneider asked me to help develop the, the digital publishing and try to get it to the next stage. We, the, the AHR has also published sort of um, occasional online pieces. Um, and so what we did was we, we thought, well, if this, if this scholarship, we scanned the horizon, the board was looking for um, you know, short form scholarship in the article form, it's monographic, it's based on uh, primary research. Um, it, it takes about as much time to read as an article. Uh, so it kind of feels like a research article. And then, uh, and yet it's presented in ways that, you, that, that, that take advantage of the affordances of the interactive media or the kinds of media that you can use. Well, we couldn't find a lot of it out there. And it's amazing, we've got so many scholars uh, creating websites about historical subjects, but they tend to be either pedagogical or sort of resource sites for those who are interested in the subject. And they're typically self-published by either an institute on the campus or by themselves. And so that was the frustration, is that this does, stuff doesn't quite look like the kind of scholarship that we, we, we pretty much build our, our careers around. And that's problematic because young scholars trying to do that stuff, like pioneers like Adam, are, um, are also you know, looking at a tenure and promotion system, and they're not quite sure how many of this is ever going to count for them. So uh, he's quite brave to be doing all this. Uh, many are sort of shrinking from it, saying, well, I'm going to wait and see you know, if my superiors are going to, my you know, senior people are going to uh, reward me for this. So, um, so we thought, well, if the AHR sort of lays out um, guidelines that this is what we would like this to look like, you know, it should, like the kind of criteria I just, I just mentioned, then maybe that will sort of help you know, cultivate it, the, the, um, uh, the form, the genre. Well, the deadline for our uh, digital prize that we announced last year has now come, and we really only have a couple submissions. <laughs> so uh, it, you know, I think it, we're, we're going to have to extend the deadline. And, um, and yet, uh, I think what this is showing is that we're not quite at the point where scholars feel comfortable just working in the digital medium, submitting their work that way. But I want to say, I think it's, it's just utterly inevitable. I think the kind of world, the cyber world that, that Adam was just outlining, is the world that we're all already in. We, we all fluidly work with digital online sources in our daily work. We read PDFs that we've discovered somehow uh, online. Um, we communicate with each other richly in this way. And it's just a matter of just letting go eventually of this, of this two-dimensional you know, two paper stuff. Um, and, and just embracing that, we're, that we can write in this medium and exchange the media, you know, create subscription business models that will allow us to, to allow the, the presses to do this uh, in a uh, sustainable way. Um, so uh, I think it's going to be like a square wave, to tell you the truth. You know, we're just, we're, we're going along like this, but in a, in a couple, five to eight years, it's just everybody's going to be working on the, in the digital um, media. media. And, uh, Maybe this is the perfect time to transition to my uh, university press colleagues because they're going to 
uh, perhaps uh, help us understand how, how that might um, come out the other, the, the front end, I guess. Oh, and I forgot, I was going to talk about Scalar, but I can come back to that. I'm one of the uh, heads of that project, too, um, with Tara Pearson. So that's, that's been a big, uh, that platform has been intended to solve a lot of these problems. But let me uh, give the others some time on the stage. Okay. Okay. So um, to handle a lot of the kind of problems I was just talking about, that is, uh, oops, I'm sorry. Show your email here. Root directory. Where is the? There it is. Um, okay. So I was talking earlier about the the unsustainability of spending you know, ten to twenty, thirty thousand dollars on a, you know to create an article um, in a web page, and so. Um, Tara McPherson and uh, so said I back when she had, she was editing a journal called Vectors um, uh, did just that. It, the, each article in Vectors, the, it was a multimedia um, journal uh, published out of the, um, the Cinema School at USC. Um, uh, was every article was based was custom built and designed, and uh, she would hold workshops, summer institutes, and scholars would come in and work with designers and programmers, and we would have this really uh, elaborate intellectual process of what what are the ideas that you're trying to uh, explore in, in what kind of media and how do the media, how does the interactivity actually contribute to the, the ideas and the knowledge, you know, so it's, it should just be taken for granted that I never want to touch any of this stuff if it's just for, you know, bells and whistles or, you know, fancy illustrations. There, there has to be, there has to be some intellectual purpose to uh, adopting an interactive uh, medium for your for your scholarship or for the presentation, and uh, so you know, in working with presses, we realize that the, that the future is going to have to um, reside somehow in platforms that that don't require each scholar to spend oodles of time learning the technologies or investing in these programmers and so on. But you should just be able to pick it up and, and use it somehow, and so. Scalar uh, is, it's a, the term is kind of a uh, mathematical, it's a joke about um, uh, that, that pertains to vectors and scalar is a mathematical term. So, um, but uh, the, the principal um, uh, quality I think of scalar is that it's a horizontal um, structure. So if you try to present your work in blogs and uh, or platforms like, that, like WordPress that were designed to feed blogs, um, you're locked into this sort of world of menus and hierarchical child-parent relationships. And um, it's very limiting for scholars who may get halfway into their project and realize that they would like a different structure. They realize they have some new ideas about it. And then you're stuck with all these silos and everything. And um, the same is true for uh, custom-built websites. You, know, you put all this effort into thinking about what's the ideal structure for the ideas you're trying to get across. And then, you're, then that's the structure you have for unless you want to go back and hire a bunch of more programmers. So Scalar is radically horizontal. It's just it consists of pages that can be anything. They uh, and they can be and they can be strung together in paths, so you can create narratives, um, but you can also relate them to one another in uh, in innumerable ways through tagging and also the intersection of paths across one another. Um, then you can visualize these. Uh, I could I could I could, I could I could press the button for the sort of little demo video, and I'm just just a little reluctant to do that. You can all do that yourself, I think. Um, but uh, Scalar is also open source and totally free. And as of March 31st, we just uh, made our official beta release. Um, we've been, it's been used by, OK, so the other idea about Scalar, um, it's funded by the Mellon Foundation. And it's, it's from the outset been a collaboration between archives and the back end, uh, authors, scholars in the middle, and publishers in the front end. So uh, we have. Uh, about six or seven archival partners. We have humanities center partners from around the United States. We have um, following <laughs> university presses have been partners from the outset. Uh, Cal, University of California Press, MIT, Duke, NYU, Michigan, and Open Humanities Press. And um, we have Oxford and Cambridge very interested in, in joining the consortium as well. And the reason is that they're, they're all struggling with the problems of how you would uh, come come into a world in which scholars are regularly using a sort of set of, uh, Adam mentioned that, the lack of standardization. Um, or, you know, so perhaps maybe there's a set of familiar publishing platforms, Neatline perhaps, um, and others, uh, and Scalar. So then, 
how do publishers hit, you know, treat these like a known quantity? How do they copy edit them? How do they uh, deal with version control? Um, and uh, and so, and, uh, you know, how do they manage the sustainability of the, uh, the media objects that are embedded in them? So uh, those are all questions that the publishers have to figure out in order to go forward and, and to make this um, fit into their business model. And then on the other end, uh, archives are worried about um, you know, licensing, of course, and uh, you know, what kind of search tools are, are the scholars going to have when they access that archive. So what Scalar does, it doesn't, it's not a, itself a repository at all. It simply creates links to things. And so you, you, you import media from these uh, partner archives. We have quite a few partner archives or other archives online. Embed that media in the, um, in the Scalar page. And the Scalar pages can be automatically reformatted however you want them. They can be media-centric or text-centric or a split view. And, this, and you don't have to rewrite the page. You just say, oh, I'd rather have this look like columns with the media hanging up to the right. In thumbnails, or no, I'd rather have this page now, you know, foreground that one media object right at the top. Um, and so, uh, so you can work fluidly in this way, um, and then uh, decide when to publish it, when to make it public. Um, and that can be done in collaboration with the press that you're starting to work with as you develop this project. So that's a quick introduction to Scalar. Um, you're all welcome to, you can register yourself uh, and just start making a Scalar book. There's, we're trying to make this sort of uh, self-help as possible with, um, you know, the uh, demo, you know, how-to demos on, online and so on. Okay, so that's the, that's the Scalar intro. Is that Susan? Okay, great. So um, next, uh, perhaps uh, Susan Ferber? Okay. Uh, I guess Niels Ferber is going to come from uh, UC Press. Thanks. I was just going to make some general comments and, and uh, sort of off the cuff a little bit and then um, open it up to the discussion after Susan speaks. But, um, uh, and uh, as Buffett's a kind of a Luddite who brings a notebook with, with notes that I've made, and not just any notebook, but books that we used to buy and to put into our <coughs> library when we removed books. So this, these are books we, we, we bound with blank pages to put in as a, as a rem, remnant of the past. Um, I, uh, talking about, uh, um, I mean, there were a couple of ways that I was thinking about this, this um, the, the questions that were being asked in this panel, um, and obviously the historians are more apt to talk about how research has changed, um, but it's clear to us, the publishers, that it has, and that's, I think, the, the main thing that has changed for the digital age, and as publishers are supposed to promote books, it's one of our functions, and promoting one of my own is winning the prize uh, the, at the OAH for the Peter Bogue was able to do research for this book, um, scanning all the uh, newspaper archives across the West in a way that he wouldn't have been able to do 10 years ago. Um, so a book that could have been, you know, in, in old research days, just a case study of, let's say, Oregon to talk about sexuality in the 19th century West, but now is, is able to make a much larger argument about uh, both a, a revisionist argument about the 19th century West across the board and a historiography historiographical argument in a way that simply would have been impossible to get through micro features. Um, and then Bill was too modest uh, about his own work. His, uh, his, book, um, his work on, on Los Angeles, um, which is a hypercity story, links to a hypercity project, is um, layers uh, dozens of historical maps through uh, the decades over uh, actually thousands of years um, on Los Angeles, showing how different power regions using census data, um, historical images, historical maps, and modern cartography uh, to provide contacts and contexts for um, power regimes in, in Los Angeles in a way that it would be possible. This is a born digital project that would be possible in the narrative book. So those are just some examples of the ways I think we as publishers are seeing um, the digital revolution in historical research. In terms of how new media has influenced the, the publishing industry, I wanted, before we talked about, I talked about digital um, history, uh, and, and this may, may or may not be of that much interest to you, but I wanted to talk about the business of books. I mean, this, this, we've seen the impact of uh, uh, the digital revolution much more in distribution and, um, and uh, sales than we have in, uh, in how uh, monographs are being constructed. Um, and, and the big story here is Amazon. Of course, when I went into 
obvious as it did 10 years ago. 10 years ago, everybody was talking about how e-books were going to change. It was going to be an iPod moment when music, when, when books were distributed like, like, uh, I, you know, like iTunes music is distributed now. And we haven't really seen that. I mean, if, uh, a year ago, 5% of our sales were e-book sales. This year, it's 7%. So, so it's, a, it's increasing um, you know, exponentially, but that exponent is still quite small. Um, the, uh, and it oscillates in my own. I was looking for, you know, I was thinking about something today. I was looking at my own history list to see if that was different from our demo trend. And I, I see anything from 2% to sort of 15 to 20%, but mostly of short current affairs trade books um, that are selling as e books. Um, we distribute to libraries, uh, both physically, physical books, but also we're partners with Oxford in the uh, University Press Scholarship Online, uh, where we aggregate. Um, books in a field like history or anthropology or sociology and sell them almost like a subscription to libraries digitally. Um, so, uh, and, and there are obviously benefits that just goes to that to that where scholars can like, you know, check the bibliographies and make other scholarships available on the internet. It's sort of a, 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 you know, a, a proposal of someone having this discussion today because next week the Digital Public Library of America is launching um, with Dan Cohen as the uh, CEO of it, who, uh, he was uh, the head of the Roy Rosenzweig. Um, uh, is a historian and was the head of the, he was the head of the Center of History and New Media at um, George Mason. Um, so these are all exciting developments. We're going to see how they impact that. But, but uh, there's no question that, that digital delivery um, will be more and more important. But there's still and moving on to digital publishing, we're still seeing that as the monograph form and the book form, whether we distribute it as a print book or as an e-book, that's how it's being produced. And we're, we're trying to watch very carefully to what you want um, and how you use this material to see how we can provide it. Uh, but at the moment, like, like, like Phil said, tenure departments are requiring you know, print monographs, um, promotional departments are requiring that. Uh, most of the uh, instruction that we're seeing is being done through, through print books still. We're, we're getting ready for the change. And we, we, we've just recently, actually in the last couple of months, divided uh, the way we think about our operation into three formats. Uh, traditional publishing, which is still 95% of what we do. Uh, transitional, which is getting ready for this change, and transformative, which will be moving towards digital form materials, but we have to see how, how those are being used. Um, uh, but what we are doing, and I think what every publisher is doing, and I'm sort of also interested in, in how people are using this material, we're doing, you know, as Adam mentioned, digital ancillaries um, to books. Uh, I did a history of Alcatraz, where we were able to, if you go to our website, the book's website, you can hear the interviews of prisoners who were uh, you know, prisoners of Alcatraz. Um, I recently published a book on American Bandstand and uh, desegregation and youth culture. And Matt Belmont, the author, was able to use Scala, uh, not for the whole book, but as a sort of ancillary to, to his book. So if you go to the, the Scala link page to, to his book, um, you can watch clips from American Bandstand, hear interviews, see, um, see posters, and read an extra narrative in a non linear form. What, you know, I was going, I was checking this that website to when I was thinking about this panel, and there's space for people to add um, their memories of American Afghanistan or comments, and I haven't seen any of those. So I, it's still unclear to publishers mm -hmm. how many people are clicking through, whether they're teaching a book or whether they're doing research on a book to see to use these materials. And until we know that people are using them, it, it, it's difficult to 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 see how. I mean, everything's expensive. I mean, with scale, it's less expensive, but it's, it's difficult for us to see how um, we can provide that material until that enough people are using it and, and we can make it work. Um, there, so I think what you know, what's interesting uh, about this discussion is what will the next, how this will change, not just distributing and, and, and uh, publicizing regular book formats, but how it's going to change the form the book itself. And there are a few ways that I'm seeing already. Something I'm very excited about and we're trying to push California to do, but we're not doing it yet, is the e-shorts. 
with uh, Princeton and University of North Carolina folks who are already doing, um, where they publish material that's longer than a journal article but shorter than a book, but as digital only material on key topics. Um, I mean, I think the challenge with that is still, and again, I'm curious how many people even know about these programs, so we'll use them. Um, and, and the difficulty is marketing them, right? because they, they come out of them as a traditional book, and, and we're not sure how many people find out about them. Um, and then uh, there are, um, you know, MOOCs, massive online, um, open online courses, which seemed like a big trend a year ago, and now there are huge questions raised about the utility of them and the materials for them. Um, it's clear, I, I suspect Susan might talk about this more. I don't do much reference work. I mean, that's where the publishers have moved, you know, completely to, uh, I, mean, I don't think. Encyclopedia Britannica went out of business right a year ago. I think uh, you, know, uh, you can't do reference work without digital platforms anymore. Um, and then there are some other presses, like Alexander Street Press, that, that provide, uh, that publish uh, online collections uh, rather than books. So you can get collections on Black History or diaries. Or so. so I think there, there, there are some indications of how revolution is, is changing the format itself, but it's, it's still clear, it's unclear how without mass being you know, quite big support from the Mellon Foundation for France to uh, produce uh, materials um, that, uh, that people want to use. saying, yes, I'll do that, at every moment that every other part of your body says, no, I shouldn't, then my uh, reaction to being asked to be on a panel about research and publishing the digital, digital aid was absolute total terror about a year ago. I thought, I'm, I'm completely the wrong person. I'm a, a history book editor. I am I'm a dinosaur era person. I certainly don't opine on the future all that often, and I wouldn't be doing this as a researcher. So I spent more time than I thought I would in the past year trying to learn from others to think about digital humanities, to figure out what that term even meant, to um, to join Twitter and to figure out if that was something that I thought was was useful in terms of, of research. Um, and more often I ended up thinking about the projects that, as an editor at Oxford, I was asked to in some ways consult on, um, or at least to be a participant in the company, to think about things that reference um, at being the very forward-thinking department that it is, have been putting together in terms of born digital. Um, I think the opportunities for digital in terms of group collaboration and big vision projects is extraordinary. Um, in many ways, I feel like reference as, as a publishing genre has had to reinvent and, reinvent and transform itself every few years. When I was thinking about this, I was thinking, okay, well, the Enlightenment Encyclopedia was a sort of the, the, the big move many centuries ago, and how is it that, that things have sped up so that these projects, and thinking about them maybe every five to 10 years or, or even closer together is being done now. Um, in some ways, the research never ends in the digital age. It's something else that I was thinking a great deal about um, in terms of both the model and the mode of, of doing things and also the content. Um, so without becoming an infomercial, I'll just say that, that please come by the Oxford booth and take a look at some of the projects that my colleagues who are much, much smarter than I am and have invested much more time in thinking about things like scholarly editions online. How do you take annotated scholarly editions of the masterworks of Gladstone or of major thinkers and, and actually add something that could not be done in print form? Or Neil was mentioning the University Press Scholarship online and the ways in which aggregating monographs from a number of presses produce an ability to, to, to make information discoverable that in many ways the library shelves I think are, are quite optimal for but are not the way of the future. Um, and also major reference works and the ways that those get created from the ground up. So I encourage you to kind of take a look at those. But I'm, I've got more comments that I was thinking about in terms of of what I've spent the last few months um, doing, none of which I think is revolutionary, but I felt like immersing myself a little more would give me at least something to comment on that maybe all of you are already doing, um, but perhaps not. It's all time consuming is one thing that, that, I, that I realized, that you can be led you know, down, down a rabbit hole and never come back out. And in, in many ways, what, what I've 
realized is that I actually do want to stay in the, in the rabbit hole that I live in, um, which perhaps is not the, the thing that I should have come to a year later, but, but really was. Um, when, I, when I say that research in the digital age never ends, I think the ability to show your note cards and to give everybody the, the sort of carefully curated primary source material, the ability to do that is greater than ever. Um, for historians, is that actually what we want to do? I think that's a very big question. Um, allowing people to look at that material and ask different questions out, it requires an amazing amount of trust um, in fellow scholars and the ability to sort of let go of the proprietary nature of, of that stuff. Um, the possibility for collecting new material post-publication, I think, is also extraordinary. And to me, that's an upside. One of the things that, um, that I did a couple of months ago was go to Bath Spa University, which is not a place that I had ever visited, didn't know very much about, but in fact has an undergraduate track in publishing. Um, and are working with scholars on campus, but also undergraduates creating digital projects from scratch. So I went out to evaluate their projects and to see what they were actually doing. Um, does any of it look like something that can be monetized in an easy way? Not really. Um, not to my eyes, at least. But maybe it's not all about coming up with ways to make money. Maybe it is about actually just getting people who are not dinosaur like me to think about ways in which they can present material. And that was, in fact, what they were doing, was as groups, and I think it's much more group-oriented than, than historians are traditionally used to working, um, was to bring together material. One person that, that they um, had an actual concrete example was a scholar, named, a historian named Hannah Diamond, who had published a book with Oxford, not one that I'd worked on, um, called Fleeing Hitler. And she had published the book, and years later, created something, because what people started doing was coming to her with letters and photos and stories. And I think anything that's genealogical in nature, um, or has this sort of memoir and, and um, an element to it, I think is, is easy to see where there's a continuing, ongoing life in a non-scholarly environment. And that was, in fact, what she was doing. Hannah Diamond was being asked to basically curate and preserve materials and wanted to not alter her book. I don't think anything she was getting was altering her argument. Um, and I did actually outright ask that question because I thought, well, what if she published the book and five years later had all this material, worked with, um, worked with web designers, worked with people on campus in the publishing program, and had gotten university funds, and then discovered that maybe what she'd written was in fact not the argument anymore. And she said, no, that actually wasn't the case. So it was a way of amplifying, and certainly I know other people who have done this, um, but I think it's given an ongoing life to the material. Whether that's actually added to sales, I think is, is an open question. Um, and it's a site that she's sort of gotten, gotten up and running and is just launching. So it's hard to see how many hits there are yet and whether there will be reactions to this. Um, again, this is not something that's, that's so re revolutionary, but it, it seemed to me the idea of creating something five to six to seven years later after a book came out, rather than sort of inventing it at the time, was, um, was, was something interesting to me. Because normally when you finish a project, you may go into something else and sort of leave that other project behind at the same time that people are first coming to it and starting to have reactions. Um, I don't have anything that I have discovered from about digital humanities that I can say that is in any way intelligent. But I will say that this issue of how to ask questions of data differently is something that I find very compelling. And I'm, and I'm very happy that a place like the Institute for Historical Research at the University of London actually has courses that people can go into and that are free and they can learn how to use the material um, and to think about how other scholars are working with networks or working with other things that they may not have thought about with their own projects. And it strikes me that it's very hard at a certain point in one's career to step back and say, I don't know anything about this, but I think I should find out. Um, and, I've, and I've thought about doing that in a, in a big way and then I thought, actually, I still need to edit my manuscripts. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about costs and operations, but I think it, in some ways, Phil has given us a much clearer sense. What does it cost to do these things? There have been the names of foundations um, and humanities programs and research councils mentioned, and there's a good reason for this. It's expensive to do this, and publishers have not yet, for the most part, outside of worlds where large projects are created in their subscription models, figured out ways with, let's say, the research monograph or the, the crossover or trade book to make these additional parts of, of research available in a way that people will pay for. Um, so the financial returns on these things are very hard to actually begin to think about. We're still at the point when we've you know, created models where we can add in ebook revenue, which we're guessing about. I mean, you're guessing about the life of the print book too, but at least you have much more information to go on. Trying to put together models of ebooks, um, the sort of uh, the, the 
collaborative websites that might go along with things that might not be um, for, for pay. All of these things require different ways of thinking about the, the kinds of uh, financial programs that we work with at publishers. These are not the quickest changing things. Um, Coming back to this idea of the research ever ends, I think my, my bigger philosophical concern, and the thing that uh, I guess probably philosophical is too high for Newton to say, but as more and more primary source become, material becomes available, um, and people don't necessarily have to, as scholars, travel to obscure and remote archives and transcribe everything by hand in places where they won't even let, you know, the archivists might not even let them touch the, the materials. Um, without having gloves on, how does that actually change the books that are being written? And that's the thing that I've like sort of been grappling with more and that I think still remains to be seen. And historians perhaps are not the best first model of this. Um, I think there's a reason why historians are sort of led down a path generally towards working with materials from the past. And many people who are doing things that are centuries old, I think, have a very different relationship when there's such a limited number of sources. There is one project that I worked on that I realized would not have existed. Um, had it not been a, a digital moment. And it's not an Americanist project, it's something called Mr. Collier's Letter Racks that an, uh, a, a cultural historian of the 18th century Dwar Warman put together. Perhaps you may have seen the, the cover of AHA Perspectives that had a painting of letter racks with um, quills stuck in it and papers and newspapers, and there are, there are many of these around. Um, what he was able to do, because none of them exist in one collection, it wasn't even clear that there was one artist, was able to actually look at, at hundreds of these. And this would not have been possible for the museums, the private collections, and all the other sources, for him to actually even look at them and to begin to make arguments about sort of unpacking what those letter racks were doing, what kinds of clues were hidden in them, and to make an argument about the information age. What did I care about at the end of the day was how did this manuscript read? I mean, that was as, as an acquisitions editor, and as somebody who spends a lot of time working on the, the, the literally the printed out version of this, which I know makes me incredibly dinosaur-like, what did it matter to me that this person could do it? I was picking up from a point where I wanted to know, how is this narrative working? Um, you know, where, where are the disconnects? How is this argument flowing? All of the very traditional questions that I still ask about things. So I guess I'm gonna end on a slightly cautionary note, which is perhaps not the reason people are leaving, but it might be. Um, <laughs> as more time is spent finding source material, is less time being spent on interpreting and digesting it. I guess that's the thing I worry about the most, other than is overwriting becoming rampant simply because it's possible to get so much more stuff. Well, from what I can tell, given the utter clutter that is my office, and I think everybody at, at OEP is completely fearful of the fact that something will catch fire in there and it will take the building down. Um, and I keep saying, historians, they, 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 send, they, they write long and they, they have a lot of paper. Um, but this somehow, this argument doesn't get me that far. Um, I think it's a different mental process thinking about data dumps from files, be they source material that is available digitally, notes from secondary sources, um, things that are scanned as digital images, but how do you actually take that and think about it and write it? Um, that's something that as I step back and think about this digital age, I'm not sure if our, if our mental faculties have changed in the ways that digital has actually changed things. I think it was very different when I talked with some of my extremely senior authors. Um, when you thought about what you were writing and you hand wrote it, and maybe you had three or four sentences a day that were amazingly good sentences, and then you had to pay somebody to type one or two versions, or maybe you had a spouse who did all that typing for you. Um, and I'm not going to say there wasn't payment of any other sort going on there, but it's a very different process to do that than to constantly be typing and to know that there can be data dump files. This is the all the thoughts I have today. Maybe that's where I put something like, like Twitter. Um, it requires a lot more discipline and a lot more stringent formation of ideas to get down a structure um, and to actually have the kinds of ways that we think about putting projects together that it does to do sort of free-form writing. Um, paradoxically, I think few authors draw lessons from social media about less being more, despite the fact that many people are using Facebook and Twitter and other forms of social media who are historians. I think this idea that the limited amount of space that you might have does not carry over to the book idea. <laughs> so what I see is far longer, far, far longer manuscripts, not necessarily fully digested. I can sort of see maybe the pieces um, where things might have come from, from presentations, from articles, from ideas that people have put together from workshops, but don't necessarily have a sort of clean and consistent flow that are, I'm not going to say, 
completely regurgitated, but at least partially regurgitated and repurposed qualities. Um, and so on a less optimistic note, I think, well, it's very easy to get 800, 900 manuscript pages out and to feel like the sort of the mass of stuff being produced is good, because of course producing more is good, getting more of the writing done. I, nobody says I've done less writing today, and that's a good thing, but I think maybe we should. Um, there's an enormous expectation that readers will have more time and patience to deal with longer stuff. And I think what the digital age has taught me, if nothing else, is that engaging in long form, it is an art. Um, and I think it's an art that many people are losing as they get, are very, very attached to things that are the sort of constant hit of material. So I think. Uh, more than anything, what I've thought about, that the onus has, has come much more back to editors and to third parties who are not the authors to think about um, how this material is coming together and to be able to say, no, there's too much here, and how do we limit this? Um, so I'm not sure if the historians have the natural bent for the digital age, but I'd like to see more about the ways in which it's impacting research. And I also think that there may be a time, though I'm not sure we're there now, that forms of writing that we value, that we really value, the books that we love, and I think about whether we're reading them in ebook form or print form, that they haven't changed significantly over the decades. And maybe that's a little bit of a conservative and, and reactionary message, but I'll end on that. <laughs>